All right, so if you've been to Disney's Hollywood Studios at all in your life, chances are you've spent some time in the Echo Lake area. It's a small but respectable area of the park, just past the main entrance and right outside of Galaxy's Edge. And there's a nice variety of attractions. You got Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Frozen, Mickey, a couple of meet and greets, and a dinosaur. It's something you probably forget about until you see it. Then it makes you go, oh, why is that there? Well, that's what we're here to answer today, because this statue is a tribute to a greater part of film history. Without it, we might not have had a Disney World in the first place. What history am I talking about? Let's get into it. Before we can talk about the dinosaur, we need to talk about the man behind it. Once upon a time, there was a cartoonist named Windsor McKay. He's best known for his comic strips like Dream of Rarebit Fiend, and probably his most famous work, Little Nemo in Slumberland. He also did a lot of political and editorial cartoons for publications like the Chicago Herald. But he's also credited for his contributions to animation. He was an early pioneer of the medium, creating short-form cartoons before the likes of Disney and Warner Brothers, to the point where he's often called the godfather of American animation. Even when judged by today's standards, his cartoons are really impressive. Doubly so when you remember that every single frame needed to be hand-drawn on a piece of paper. Flash didn't exist back then. You're looking at one man's hard work. If you ever have the time, I highly recommend looking into them yourself, especially if you're any kind of animation fan. Anyways, by 1906, McKay had begun to work in the vaudeville circuit, doing chalk drawings. These were performances where he drew on a chalkboard while he talked to the audience. So... I guess he also invented speed painting. He began making cartoons shortly after, inspired by flipbooks his son had purchased and he incorporated the cartoons into his vaudeville act. One act, involving his Little Nemo characters, would be filmed and shown in theaters across the country. His next film centered on a mosquito sucking on a man's blood. What you're looking at is one of the first cartoons to ever feature a character with a discernible personality. People like James Stewart Blackton and Emil Cohn had experimented with animation beforehand, but there is something to be said about the complexities of McKay's work. In fact, that was something he was criticized for. The drawings were so realistic and so well done that people accused him of tracing and copying photographs. So the next time someone yells at you on Twitter for using drawing references, remember that even the greats had to deal with that bullshit. Well, McKay wanted to prove these people wrong, so his next film would be about something that was impossible to photograph. A dinosaur. Dinosaurs had long since entered the popular consciousness. The 19th century marked the beginning of Dinosauria, the study of dinosaurs. Fossils were being discovered all over the world, and as more of them were found, more people started getting interested in them. By the end of the century, they were well known by the public. But yes, in 1914, McKay introduced the world to Gertie the Dinosaur. The act involved McKay talking to the audience, interacting with a cartoon of a dinosaur named, well, Gertie. Gertie was animated on rice paper. McKay drew the dinosaur, while his assistant, John A. Fitzsimmons, drew the backgrounds, tracing it on every single frame. Which... Can you imagine how tedious that would be? It's no wonder why later animators would switch to cell painting, allowing characters to move separately from the background. But that was a big advancement in this animation, one of the first times we saw a detailed background with a character in it. It grounded the cartoon and made it more lifelike. McKay also played around with perspective. Gertie got bigger as she got closer to the camera, and it gave her things to interact with. McKay also basically invented tweening, the technique where you draw gestures of action before going in with keyframes for details. It allows the character's movement to feel more realistic, keeping their proportions on model and making them feel grounded and less floaty. These are industry standards nowadays, but it was groundbreaking back then. What made this short really stand out, though, is that Gertie had a distinct personality. This wasn't a character made to be an excuse to tell jokes. She lived on the screen. We see her eating, drinking, breathing, and even crying. He had experimented with that before, but it really shines here. For a 1914 audience, it was something entirely new. What makes this so remarkable is that McKay had nothing to go off on. He did it all on his own, with no references. Audiences were amazed by it, and quickly fell in love with the giant dinosaur. Gertie the Dinosaur was listed at number 6, 
on the 50 Greatest Cartoons of All Time list and was preserved in the Library of Congress's National Film Registry in 1991. As the decades persisted, the medium of animation continued to evolve and change. People like the Fleischers, Up Iwerks, and yes, the Disney team would develop new techniques, advancing the process. And all of that might not have happened had we not had the foundation that people like McKay built. Upon meeting his son Robert, Walt gestured out the window towards the studio and said, Bob, all of this should be your father's. He was well aware of the debt he owed to McKay and his work. Disney would tackle dinosaurs many times in their cartoons, the most notable being the Rite of Spring segment in Fantasia. The animators faced the same kind of challenges that Windsor McKay faced, making dinosaurs that looked and moved realistically. You can look at a deer and figure out how to make that move realistically. You can't really do that for an extinct animal. So they essentially had to make it up as they went along. They too were doing something without any previous references. Walt had told the animators, he said, don't animate it like Pluto or like the dwarfs. Animate it like a real dinosaur walking, you know? And they'd say, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean it's like a real dinosaur walking? Who's going to know? Plus, it's just incredible to compare how much the medium had evolved in the 26 years since Gertie's release. episode of Disneyland, the show tackled the history of the medium of animation, from early cave paintings to the classic Disney animated films. A large segment of the episode, The Story of the Animated Drawing, was dedicated to the works of Windsor McKay. To illustrate his impact on the medium, they did a recreation of his original Gertie the Dinosaur vaudeville act. It features an actor portraying McKay, interacting with the cartoon as he did in real life. The aforementioned Robert McKay acted as a consultant on this scene. This is probably the closest that we'll ever get to seeing McKay's original act nowadays. During the episode, Walt succinctly summarized the cartoon's impact with the following words. Windsor McKay's Gertie and other animation novelties stimulated a great public interest and created a demand for this new medium. This in turn encouraged other pioneers to creative efforts that in time led to the establishment of the animated cartoon as an industry. So, what does any of this have to do with Hollywood Studios? Well, since the beginning, the park has been a celebration of Hollywood and its history. Animation has always been a huge part of that, regardless of what its detractors might say. So, to pay tribute to that history, they constructed a large-scale model of Gertie, sitting on Echo Lake, right across from Indiana Jones. She's munching down some leaves, probably from a tree she just ate, and the statue is home to an ice cream stand, Dinosaur Gertie's Ice Cream of Extinction. You can get your choice of vanilla, chocolate, or swirl in a waffle cone or in a cup. If that isn't your thing, you can also get a Mickey bar or a Mickey ice cream sandwich, which explains why she's got the snow on her head and back. And every Christmas, she gets decked out with a Santa hat and an ornament hanging from her mouth. Over there is Gertie the Dinosaur, where the best ice cream in the land of dreams can be had at any time. Even though Hollywood Studios has gone through many changes over the years, Gertie has remained. Most people walk right past Gertie the Dinosaur, thinking that she's just a random decoration that doesn't really fit. But she isn't. She's a tribute to animation history. Windsor McKay passed away in 1934, never getting to see what the medium would become in the following decades. But his legacy continues to live on. So next time you find yourself at Hollywood Studios, take a moment to look at Gertie and appreciate the history that she represents. And that concludes the video. Now I'll pass the question on to you. What do you think of Gertie? Were you aware of the story behind her? What other piece of Disney history should we explore next? Whatever your thoughts, let me know down in the comments. If you'd like to support the show, consider hitting up my Patreon or Ko-fi page. If not, then be sure to like and subscribe to see more of my stuff. But that's all the time I've got for today. Thank you so much for watching as always, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care.